some of the material I'm going to talk about today is similar to what, I mean, it has uh, relations to a lot of things that these new things Jerry talked about, such as this brass piece that was inducing changes in the easy signals. I found something quite similar over the last two years just from putting water inside of an enclosure without any contact at all, and it would change the spectrographic qualities as well as the reactivity of plant growth to that water. And this is without having any touch of materials into the water itself, just by putting the water inside of an enclosure made of different materials. Okay, I would reference uh, my prior papers to the water conference. I have two articles in the water journal. Uh, I think uh, the, the primary one is the uh, volume number three, uh, which will give you a lot of background. Uh, but my work is mostly centered from the work of Dr. Willem Reich, who is one of these geniuses of the 20th century science who was uh, badly mistreated and slandered. And I picked up on his work when I was an undergraduate student and did my graduate research on his stuff and found it very fascinating and, and helpful for understanding a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, the innovative and new research that I was doing and that other people were doing as well. So he's somebody that you want to investigate in my recommendation, especially the orgone energy accumulator. This is a large orgone accumulator dark room, metal lined uh, room, and inside of which are these orgone accumulator boxes, the so-called orgone box. And they are basically like a, somewhat like a Faraday cage, but also they resemble a capacitor in that the walls are composed of alternating layers of ferromagnetic material and dielectric material preferably fiberglass or sheep's wool with a high lanolin content. And, well, a capacitor that is hollow, if you will, a hollowed out space on the inside. So this is a, a conceptually, there's nothing like this uh, until Reich discovered it, and it's something that's really quite important. Uh, there are all kinds of biological effects. He was treating people medically with this uh, and finding that symptoms of major diseases would, would decline. Uh, it, it boosts the immune system. You can see changes in people's blood work, uh, healing of wounds and sores, uh, all kinds of life-positive biological benefits which got him into trouble with the American Medical Association and the Food and Drug Association. He wound up getting his books burned by the Food and Drug Association and uh, died in prison because he dared to defend his findings to a United States Supreme Court and the Anyway, that's another story. I've written books on this, and I don't want to get into that now, but I did replication work of Reich's uh, findings in, in a more biophysical realm. My background is in, as an environmental scientist and later uh, got my PhD in geography, studying atmospheric sci and earth science. Uh, and some of the studies I did, boosting seed growth is really quite interesting, um, putting the seeds in a glass evaporation dish with water and charging it up and you get an uh, increase of around 40% as a systematic result. I've, I did this year after year at my laboratory for s the student seminars. I'd have the students do the experiments to prove to themselves that this is a real thing and uh, eventually published the results of several years of work on this sort of thing. Uh, and it's, it's very real, very systematic. It can be reproduced. And there are doctors who have done studies on cancer mice that give very similar kinds of a life positive benefit. You just charge the mice in an orgone accumulator for a couple of hours each day. And uh, Reich found that he could get the cancer mice to live three times longer than the control groups. And uh, others have, have uh, replicated that showing two times, one and a half times, uh, diff depending upon where the laboratory is located. And the, climatic conditions and so forth. So these are, this is, uh, there's actually been two double-blind studies done at German universities, one at University of Marburg in 86, another one at the University of Vienna in, I think, around 1990, uh, verifying that um, human physiological reactions to the organ accumulator are real as compared to a dummy box, and they go in the direction of an exp 
uh, a stimulation of your parasympathetic nervous system, which governs things like uh, relaxation, uh, breath, uh, heart regularity. Uh, you, it's the ah effect, the, the relaxation effect. And that when the organ accumulator will stimulate that in people in, and proven with good levels of statistical significance in double blind controlled studies. Um, so the question I always had is, uh, and which was stimulated in part by my contact with Jerry and others at this conference, at these conferences, is, is this an effect upon the water in the living system itself? Um, and uh, so I, I started to look at the water, just charging water up in, inside organ energy accumulators as compared to control boxes. And I was able to confirm a spectrographic signature in the ultraviolet region. I presented on this a couple of years ago. And uh, this is using the best available technology, nice little ocean optics, uh, UV visible spectrometers and um, quartz cuvettes. And here you can see a special accumulator made for charging up water in the glass evaporation dish. and. Uh, finding these spectrographic signatures, uh, testing the, the charged up water versus control water from the same source, uh, and you see that the organ charged water develops these peaks around 240 nanometers. I found other cases, there's two, around 280 nanometers with a bimodal uh, peak. This is the differential between them at the starting of the charging. This is after they've been charging, in this case, for 24 days. That's a long period of time, but I found other materials that will induce these kinds of signatures in water uh, very quickly, within a day or two days. I'll show you that momentarily. Here's another comparison, the charged water versus the controlled water. Again, uh, this is over eight days, 240 nanometer peak. So. This was a, a confirmation that the accumulator was able to do something to the water itself, and that was new. Um, and I used in, over, over the, doing this over a couple of years, I found, I used distilled water only because uh, I, there were questions about the complicating effects of minerals in the water and I, how do I standardize that? And I found, well, I couldn't, I had to use distilled water just to get rid of the, those questions. And then secondly, I found that commercially available distilled water was not all uniform either. That you had to test, you know, I went to this, the, the different stores in Ashland, Oregon, where I live, and I bought f five or 10 different jugs of different brands of distilled water and tested them one against each other. And some of them I found already had a certain kind of a, a ultraviolet signature in them and so I would select the one that had none, uh, the lowest ultraviolet sensitivity, and I would use that as my comparative uh, control f against everything else. And uh, that was where I, it began to get some very interesting results um, of a quite different nature. And I remember one particular experiment I did where I had the water was in the organ accumulator, and I said, well, I need something as a control that's going to shield out dust and other things that might fall into the dish of, of uh, control water. So I had a, a cellulose acetate microscope uh, cover, which seemed to fill that job very nicely, and it had about the same volume of air inside of it as the accumulator I was using, and I covered it with a black pla plastic light cover. And I found that this, this hood made of cellulose acetate created an ultraviolet spectral response inside the water far greater than the accumulator ever did. And here you can see some of these, I, I got several different of these hoods and, and dif different materials, and they were giving this very big boost. Remember, th uh, the, th the three up here is the maximum sensitivity of this particular spectrometer. So this was a very big effect that occurred within a couple of days, and uh, uh, the, the accumulator was doing very poorly by comparison to this. So this got me very puzzled. I thought, well, you know, could you make a cellulose acetate box and boost the growth of seedlings? You know, I mean, it, it, it was a, a puzzlement for a long time. Uh, so I started investigating all kinds of materials, making boxes out of them, enclosures, 
and putting the water inside these enclosures without contact, only, the only contact the water has is with the Pyrex glass evap uh, evaporation dish. I used acrylic, Lexon, wood, cardboard, fiberglass, ordinary glass, ceramics, slate, stone, polyethylene, styrofoam, and the cellulose acetate as enclosures only. And I also used metal, steel, copper, aluminum, and lead. And I would charge, things, charge up these dishes of water in there for a period of time and then uh, evaluate them spectrographically. And uh, what I found is that the organ accumulator and the cellulose acetate gave the, gave the strongest responses in these ultraviolet frequencies. The others had some effects variable, but those two were the most important ones. Here you can see some of the different enclosures are put on a testing uh, table, and then I would cover the table with black plastic like used in uh, strawberry growers to block out the light on the, on the fields and kill the weeds. It's cheaply available. So I, and here's the accumulators, again with the dishes of water inside. And this is in my laboratory room which has uh, got about the same temperature. I did studies on seed sprouting and other kinds of things with different temperatures and found that uh, you, could, you could get this, a good controlled result if everything was in a, a couple of degrees uh, that it wouldn't uh, affect too much. Uh, but anyway, here, here you can see uh, 11 days of charging. This is a cellulose enclosure and the organ accumulator is down here. So you can see the accumulator is only about uh, 25% of what the cellulose is giving. But if you let it go further, 22 days of charging, and here you can see the cellulose is way up here, and it's got like a, it almost behaves like an ultraviolet cutoff filter. Everything lower than 290 nanometers is, basic, is basically uh, shut out of transmission through that uh, sample of water once it's been uh, charged up with the cellulose. Now, I, maybe it isn't really totally opaque at that point, but it's for the maximum sensitivity of the particular spectrometer I'm using. And the organ accumulator came in second, cut off at about 265 nanometers. And then all these other different enclosures uh, gave variable results, as you can see down here. I, I ran several different series of these kinds of experiments using different boxes and basically that, that, as I said, the accumulator and the cellulose acetate gave the strongest responses here. And then I began to question, well, what about the fluorescence spectrometry? Because I had this idea from Wilhelm Reich that uh, Reich was talking about that when objects or water or space itself as in a vacuum tube becomes charged with a higher concentration of orgone energy. It takes less excitation to cause it to flare up into a blue color. So he talked about uh, illumination of water, of air, of even people's energy fields with a bluish glow uh, that would occur under conditions of a high or organotic charge and excitation. And uh, so my thinking was, well, if water under strong charging in the organ accumulator is absorbing ultraviolet preferentially, maybe it's going to give a fluorescence in the blue colors, as Reich would, was arguing. So I tested it out and basically confirmed this. Uh, in order to do so, I had to get a very good UV light source, which uh, which is what you see here, also from ocean optics. And uh, here's the fluorescence cuvette, and then to the, uh, the spectrometer, and it all got very well recorded. And I did this with control water samples versus the orgone-charged water samples and the cellulose water samples and a few others. And here's an initial result. After three and a half days, the cellulose shows this very a large peak as compared to the organ accumulator. But if you charge them up for a few more days, the accumulator tends to grow and develop and eventually outpaces the cellulose. This is in the fluorescence. I didn't find this in the 
in the UV absorption, but I did find it in the fluorescence. So here's, you can see the organ accumulator after eight days of charging, it's gotten stronger than the cellulose uh, for certain frequencies, except in this little band here. And these peaks here, I'm not sure what that is. That seems to be a, a, the, the cuvettes that I'm using, some kind of a, an anomaly in the particular material of those cuvettes. <coughs> so maybe somebody who's a better uh, educated in spectroscopy cuvettes might tell me what those are, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. At any rate, the rest of the curves show this very clear effect from simple non-contact charging. So then I got excited. I thought, well, wow, now maybe we can make an organ accumulator that's supercharged by using cellulose acetate materials. And so I started making all kinds of accumulators that used cellulose acetate as one of the variable materials. And, uh, and I found that this was not the case. When you started to grow seedlings inside these things with the cellulose, it had a negative effect on the growth. And here you can see the standard organ charge seedlings. Here's some control samples made of uh, the black plastic only or cardboard box. Here's one with polypropylene, which is it, it, the thicker layer of it. It's the same material used in that black plastic uh, agricultural sheet. But here's the cellulose acetate. It just really killed everything, it just stunted them. You would see the seedlings sprouting in the water. Again, this is, this is uh, where you're putting the seedlings and the water inside the enclosure at the same time. And uh, they would all grow about the same result over the first uh, four or five days. But at that point, then the accumulator group would grow and grow and grow. And the cellulose ones, you'd see that they would start to stand up and then fall down and they weren't really uh, doing very well. And after a while they start just rotting in the dish and it, uh, you know, you can see there's nothing there. I did several runs of this and I'm, I'm confident that this is a replicable effect as well. Here's a couple from a different series, a couple of the cellulose charged. This is the accumulator ones. Here's this black plastic actually. This, this is a material, this, I got from a friend of mine. It's a thicker black plastic material used in some kind of agricultural work. This is from a professor of soil science. He says he was using it as a, for some of his experiments and it seemed to give a, 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 a beneficial boost all by itself. So I tried that one and it, it did in, seen, in turn uh, seem to uh, boost the seedlings as compared to a cardboard, not as much as the accumulator, but the cellulose just smashed everything down and uh, got very little growth, even though the cellulose was giving these very big water ultraviolet signals as well as the uh, fluorescent signals. And then to add to the mystery, I charged up the water only, and then in a separate group of seed sprouting dishes, transferred the water from the charged enclosures into the seeds to see if the effect was transferable from the water over to the seedlings. And I found that it was not so easy. Uh, it was not really transferable. Uh, this picture actually, I, it, it shows a, a result which I was doing just before coming here. Uh, and I think if I did some number crunching on the lengths of the seedlings, which is something I intend to do, I've still got them drying in my lab, um, that it will show that the cellulose is a little bit more stunted than the, uh, the accumulator, but this is something that's ongoing right now. But I simply pointed out that in this case, it did not confirm exactly what I, my expectation was, is that the water itself would transfer over. So it seems that the enclosures themselves have an, an immediate effect while things are growing in there, uh, but if you take the water out and remove it, it's not necessarily going to be sustained. Um, that's, that's a preliminary hypothesis on that particular aspect. Um, so there's a lot of open questions that come from this as well as the insights and the documentation that's come. Um, so I raise the question, if, if Wilhelm Reich's organ accumulator 
is the source of the, it gives us a, a, an understanding of the source of the bluish glows that are oftentimes reported from living water in the healing waters or in uh, other contexts, in natural hot springs, beautiful blue oceans, lakes, glacier ice, and so forth. A lot of natural phenomenon when the sunlight strikes it and sunlight carries that UV with it as well as a lot of the whole spectrum of its frequencies and you, you see these blue glows. And it, you know, sometimes uh, we, ha we have the explanation of Raleigh with light scattering that goes back uh, more than 100 years, I believe. And that's good for explaining a lot of things. But when you look at some of these bluish phenomena in nature, they give you the appearance of a glow. There's even flowers now that the biologists have shown that give off a blue UV signature that attract the bees. And it's a very clear UV signature that's stronger than what, uh, or at least it's, it's uh, not something that you expect from mere reflectivity. It's something generated by the flower itself. Or, I would argue, by the, by the water in the flower, which is generating this UV signal upon the excitation of the sunlight. Okay? So uh, it's not just a UV glow in the flower also. It goes into the blue frequencies. You, my, my wife grows in her garden some of these flowers, and when you look at them, in the shade, after the sun has moved behind a tree, they look like they're glowing with a deep, deep, dark blue color to your eyes. Uh, and th this is what, what the, uh, the, the people who study the bees are saying that these flowers are giving off the same signature of ultraviolet light as well, which attracts the bees right to them. And of course, these flowers are swarming with bumblebees in, in the natural environment where we live. Um, so, <clears throat> here's a couple of these pictures. I mean, you can, you can go on internet and find all kinds of things like this, or make, in your own travels, you've probably seen things. This is, actually, this is not the looking up, taking a photograph of the blue sky behind the trees. This is looking down into Crater Lake, which has a blue color that knocks your eyes out when you look at it. But it only happens when the sunlight is shining directly on the water. Now this gives the invitation for the Raleigh scattering argument because they say, well, the, the water takes its blue glow from the sky. But I've been there I, many, many times taking my students there to, uh, on seminars, we go and take a look at this natural environment. And there's many times when the sky is sort of a pale blue and the, the lake itself is glowing a very, very deep luminescent blue. So I raise the question if this, these kind of phenomena are are a fluorescence effect rather than uh, an effect of merely light scattering. Same with there are certain kinds of humid conditions hum uh, in forest areas where the atmosphere itself begins to glow with a bluish color. You would think about the Blue Ridge Mountains in uh, uh, eastern uh, United States or uh, we have the song America the Beautiful about the Purple Mountains majesties. Today of course the, the Purple Mountains are it's more of a smoggy condition near Denver which is where that, that kind of thing used to be visible. Um, this, this particular photograph was taken from a Greek uh, travel poster by a photographer, and not too far from this location, uh, just south of here. I don't remember these. I have the exact location recorded in a, in a paper I wrote, a number three issue of Water Journal. I, I believe I give the citations. But this was photographed with standard ectochrome slide film. There was no tricks, no no uh, alteration of the photo made by the photographer whom I communicated with and got the information. So, organ accumulator can boost seedlings 35, 40%, but the cellulose enclosures stunt the growth. Poss and I, I, I raise a question, is this because the cellulose is making the water structure something toxic, or is it because it's too much of a good thing. I mean, just because a little bit of something is good doesn't mean a whole lot more is better. When Reich was doing his research with the organ accumulator on people, he noted that uh, you could overdo this. You didn't want to sit in these things forever. And I remember I was putting the water with the seeds in the accumulator and leaving them there over many, many days. So it may be that the cellulose is just adding an overcharge effect that the seeds, uh, they get too much of it. And this needs to be uh, researched by perhaps uh, 
just putting little cellulose patches inside the accumulator and see, you know, there's a number of th ways of approaching that, so I, I don't know exactly why the seeds might be stunted, and I, that needs research. Uh, you get the ultraviolet absorption anomalies at 240 and 280 nanometers. This is, has some similarities to the exclusion zone phenomenon that, that uh, Jerry and his team have been documenting for years now. And overall give a good support to Reich's claim that the organ accumulator is a special energy boosting device now shown able to alter the ultraviolet absorption and fluorescence spectra of water. Uh, and then this number four, I put a big question mark on that, secondary transfer of water by, secondary transfer of this effect by water charging uh, is inefficient, and uh, that just needs to be uh, evaluated a little bit more over time. So that's basically it, and thank you very much.